This morning, there are lingering questions about the structural integrity of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. The head of the National Transportation Safety Board saying this at last night's press conference. It's a fracture critical bridge. If a, a, a member fails, that would likely cause a portion of or the entire bridge to collapse. The preferred method for building bridges today is that there is redundancy build it, built in, whether that's transmitting loads to another member or some sort of structural redundancy. Uh, this bridge did not have redundancy. All right, joining us now is Structures Engineer and spokesman for the National Council of Structural Engineers Associations, Troy Morgan. Troy, good morning. Thanks for being here. Hi, good morning. So can you help us understand what she means uh, by structural redundancy? Why was it not present in older bridges? And is it, is it the standard now? Are new bridges being built that way? Yeah, so redundancy really refers to the ability of the bridge to, to transfer load to other elements if one of those elements happens to be damaged or destroyed. Um, and, and a lack of redundancy doesn't mean a lack of safety. Uh, it just means that uh, you know, there may be a, a higher probability of collapse under certain conditions, um, but it doesn't necessarily imply a deficiency of the, of the bridge itself. So Troy, I mean, when you look at these pictures, you see the size of this ship. We're talking you know, a ship the size and weight of a skyscraper, basically. Yeah. I mean, is there any way to build a bridge that would survive an impact like that? Uh, it, it's not really practical to design a bridge pier to absorb the impact of a vessel such as this, traveling at really any speed. I mean, these, these things weigh you know, 1,000 feet in length and up to 200 million pounds uh, of dead weight. So the, the idea is not to really design these bridge piers to absorb that kind of direct impact. It's just not, it's not feasible, it's not economical, um, but usually there are other you know, protective measures that can be taken to kind of limit the exposure of the piers to the, to the ship itself. Yeah, can you talk me through kind of what those measures are? I, I do know there were some kind of pilings in the water that in theory were designed to take some of the impact or like bump the ship into a different course. They obviously didn't work. I mean, what other ways are there to protect bridges from this kind of thing? I mean, really the, the main ways you can do it without trying to strengthen the pier itself is, is like you said, pilings or what are called dolphins, which are basically concrete uh, elements out in the water that will deflect or absorb some of the impact of an oncoming vessel. Uh, you can also build things like a, a berm or a, hill, a small hill of, of rock and soil around the pier that will act to slow the ship down as it approaches. Uh, and then a common approach is to make the span large enough to where the piers are located sufficiently outside the shipping channel so that they won't be exposed to, to oncoming vessels. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting way to think about it. I, I, I want to show our, our viewers this uh, chart that has been uh, circulating that shows how these ships have grown in size over the decades. I spent a bunch of time looking at this uh, yesterday. Uh, it goes from the 1950s at the top uh, to 2019 uh, onward there, 24 uh, bays. Uh, uh, they, the, the ships have just exploded in size. I mean, even since 2000, if you look at the letter C uh, on your screen, that's kind of what these ships used to look like. I mean, is there an argument to be made that the ships should be limited in size in some way? I mean, what are the regulations? around this, or is that also totally impractical? Well, I, I think we have to recognize the size of the ships that are being used in the industry. And then, you know, with, with any bridge that's exposed to shipping traffic, uh, it makes sense to do risk analysis and to look at the, the structure itself, the, the, the foundations, uh, the size of the ships, the speeds at which they may be traveling, and then, you know, perform an assessment of the likelihood of collapse, you know, given, those, given the size of those ships and the frequency that they're traveling by the bridge. And then that risk analysis can then inform engineers and owners as to whether or not some additional protection should, should, be, should be added through a retrofit or other rehabilitation. Yeah. Um, looking at, at the Key Bridge, uh, the, the uh, Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg, Pete Buttigieg, excuse me, is suggesting it could take upwards of two years um, to replace uh, the span, to fully uh, rebuild it. Do you think that's a realistic... Uh, timeline here and what changes do you think uh, how should the bridge look different when it's rebuilt yeah I, I think the timeline probably is measured in years just because there needs to be both the removal of the wreckage itself and then you know reopening the shipping lane and then a design and construction of the new bridge um, so all that does take time and is, is kind of a carefully considered process uh, in, in terms of the new bridge you know, I mentioned a longer span that might locate the piers you know further towards the towards the shore and, and, and away from the shipping lane um, that's one option that might be considered, um, but 
whatever options that are considered, I, I don't think that the bridge itself will be designed to, to uh, sustain a direct impact from one of these vessels. Fair enough. Structures engineer Troy Morgan at Troy, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.